Okay, so to kick things off, we have the two example problems. The first one is a water-air system, so we can make an approximation, right? What is that approximation? Yeah, so there's no solubility of the air in the water, which means it's called the one condensable component. So what we're dealing with, right, these are all phase equilibrium problems. So the starting point should always be the partial fugacities have to be equal. So the only difficult part now is substituting in our assumptions and our approximations. So for the vapor, if it's an ideal state, it's just the mole fraction times by the system pressure. That is the partial fugacity. So to recall, right, the pressure is the approximation of the pure species fugacity. And the yi times by p is the approximation of the partial fugacity given the lewis randall rule, which is volume additivity of the gases. So that's the approximations that we have already used up in that side. Now, on the liquid side, we have the mole fraction times by the vapor pressure, and I'll just write P star. A lot of times it's easier instead of writing little teeny sat or vape or something like that. So if you see P star in the future, especially on homework solutions or as I work through problems, it's just quicker to write P star as opposed to P sat. So the approximations that we've done here is that we have approximated the pure liquid fugacity as the uh, vapor pressure, meaning that we've neglected the pointing correction, and we have assumed an ideal vapor phase. Then when we mix the fluids together, the mole fraction times by the fugacity, again, this also is basically assuming volume additivity, no non-ideality when we're mixing. Right? So activity coefficient is equal to 1. Now the additional approximation we're going to make is that the mole fraction of water in the liquid phase is equal to 1 because we're going to assume that a very small amount of gas is going to dissolve in the liquid and it's going to be a, have a negligible impact. So the question is asking uh, da, 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 what is the mole fraction of water in the vapor phase at equilibrium for 1 atmosphere and 25 degrees C and also 10 atmospheres. So we're going to solve it generally, in this case y, or the mole fraction of water in the vapor, is simply equal to its vapor pressure divided by the system pressure. So the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees C from the Anton expression that we have up here, I calculated to be 3.18 kilopascals. So depending on whether we have a pressure of 1 atmosphere or 10 atmospheres, we can get two different y values, 0.0315 is what I calculated, and 0.00315, and this is for 1 atmosphere, and that's for 10 atmospheres. Conceptually, exceptionally straightforward, the only significant you know, sort of manual work on your guys' part was crunching the numbers with Anton's equation. So oftentimes in general, I will give you the vapor pressures unless I want it to be solved for at some point or some way. But on an exam scenario, I wouldn't necessarily make you just crunch Anton's equation because it's not particularly intellectually stimulating. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Next one. At what pressure does a 50-50 N-heptane N-decane mixture boil at a temperature of 60 degrees C? What is the composition of the vapor phase at this point? So what are we solving for initially? The bubble pressure, that's, that's what I was looking for. So we are looking for the uh, pressure that the system boils at. And in this case, that's called the bubble pressure. Um, it would be good to sort of commit these equations to memory. Right, the bubble pressure, assuming an ideal Routh's law mixture, is just the summation of the mole fraction times by the saturation pressures. Uh, what I calculated for uh, C7 at 60 degrees C was 28.1 kilopascals, and for decane, was 1.51 kilopascals, and so I got the bubble pressure was 
18.8 kilopascals. In this case, it was just basically a weighted average, right? Because if you recall, on a PXY diagram, the bubble curve is just a straight line. The dew curve has some nonlinearity associated with it. Okay. Now, we know the bubble pressure. If we're at the bubble point, that means that the system pressure is equal to the bubble pressure. So nothing is changing with any of the equations we're using. It's just a matter of what are we substituting and where and what approximations do we have. So to solve for the second part of uh, what is the vapor phase composition at this point, well, all we need is an expression that relates between the liquid composition and the vapor composition. We know it's a 50-50 liquid mixture. We know what the system pressure is. We know what the vapor pressures are. So the only thing we don't have is the vapor mole fractions. So in that case, we just get to use Routes Law. And from here, we can solve for y. And it's just plug and chug. Oops. I solved for C10. And that's it. Any questions? So this would be about the most straightforward, simple question that could be asked on an exam. You really can't make them more straightforward unless I gave you the vapor pressure. That would be the only real catch. Okay. So there's no concerns with that. Just a little practice problem to get us back in the mood. Uh, for vapor liquid equilibrium. Uh, now we're going to talk about low pressure, non ideal. So, this low pressure will give us an indication that this is an ideal vapor phase and that the non ideal part is going to be in the liquid phase. Right, liquid properties don't generally change all that much as a function of pressure. So if we hear the word low pressure, then we kind of think that's going to be associated with the vapor phase. Non-ideal, liquid phase. So in this case here then, the activity coefficient is not going to equal 1. We're going to have some non-ideality in the liquid mixing, which is going to cause the vapor-liquid equilibrium to change quite significantly. So our Routes Law expression that we will be working with, mole fraction times by the activity coefficient times by the saturation pressure is going to be equal to the vapor, the vapor phase partial fugacity, which we'll approximate as the mole fraction times by the pressure. This is going to be our starting point for all of these examples. Again, we need to compartmentalize what type of problem we're dealing with. In this section of the class, we're all dealing with phase equilibrium, so the starting point is getting the partial fugacities to be equal. A while back, if our starting point was a turbine or a heat exchanger, in that case it would be an energy balance or an entropy balance would be our starting point. But we also have state changes and so on and so forth. But we really only have three or four types of problems that we really talked about in the class. Balances, state changes, phase changes. That's the bulk of what we've been doing. Okay, so in an ideal scenario, just what we talked about, the bubble point is just equal to the summation of the mole fractions times by their saturation pressure. For the non-ideal case, we can work through the same math and show that it looks very similar. 
we just have the activity coefficient thrown in there. So if we were to look at a PXY diagram, in this case, we'll only draw out the bubble pressure. Now let's do a quick double check here. The Z, the, the X axis, we put the more volatile species. So should I draw the line going up into the right or down into the right? How should it draw? How should it be drawn for the bubble pressure? Up into the right. Right, because the more volatile species has the higher saturation pressure, right? It wants to boil more. So you have to have it at a higher pressure. Actually, let me do a dash line. So this is the ideal bubble pressure. On the far right side, we have the saturation pressure of component one for whatever temperature this particular PXY was drawn at. And on the far left, we have the saturation pressure for component two. At very high pressures, it is liquid. At very low pressures, it is vapor. So we'll draw out two scenarios. The activity coefficient is greater than one. That means we have positive excess Gibbs free energy of mixing based on how the activity coefficient is designed. At equilibrium, the goal is to minimize the Gibbs free energy. So if you have positive entropy, sorry, positive excess Gibbs, that means the state is sort of at a higher free energy level. And sort of on a rough conceptual level, that means the liquids don't really like each other. So if we have an activity coefficient, in the case of the purple line there, that is greater than one, should my new bubble pressure be above the Routh's Law line or below the Routh's Law line? It is above. It should look something like that. Now, it could look like a small deviation, or it could be a very large deviation. So in this case, the, the uh, pressure at the bubble point is greater than what we would expect, or rather, sorry, the partial pressure of a particular species is greater than you would expect based strictly on its relative volatility. Recall that uh, da, 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 da. yi times p is the partial pressure. Right, so the partial pressure of a particular uh, liquid is going to be higher because there's an incentive to get out of the liquid phase because basically they're not very friendly with one another. So the system will tend to boil, right, going down here. If you're reducing the pressure, it'll boil sooner than you would anticipate if it were an ideal mixture, just based on basically the weighted average of the vapor pressures. So in the case of the activity coefficient being less than one, right, you can, of course, have all sorts of different shapes going on. And in this case here, the, system, the mixture is less volatile than you would expect it'll want to stay in the liquid phase for longer. So we call this positive deviation and negative deviation from Routh's law behavior. Now at these two points, the way that I've drawn it, we have a maximum or a minimum in a PXY diagram. The same logic holds true for a TXY diagram, but it's just much easier to manipulate PXY diagrams than it is TXY diagrams. These points right here, where the change in pressure as a function of the change in composition, 
at constant temperature, if this is equal to zero, we have an azeotrope. Now we'll show this mathematically why. We'll skip over most of the math, but I'll, I'll set up how you could actually start, start the problem. Okay. <clears throat> so what, what we wrote right here is a expression where we're saying this is where we have an azeotrope. So now we have to evaluate this formula to see what are the consequences of having a maximum or a minimum in the PXY diagram. So in this case, our goal is to evaluate the change in pressure with respect to a change in the liquid composition. Because that's essentially what we plotted, right? That was the bubble pressure as a function of changing the composition at a fixed temperature. So this is equal to something we don't know yet. Well, we know the pressure. is equal to the bubble pressure based on the conditions that we have assumed for this particular problem. Right? We are looking at the very first bubble that forms in this system. We're looking at the limit of the two-phase region. So in this case, we're approaching it from the bubble side, so we're going to use the bubble equation. And so we can write this Just substituting in component one and component two. Now remember, in thermodynamics, you should always assume that everything is a function of everything. In this case here, we're going to uh, forget about a couple of things, right? So far, the only things that are not a function of x1 in this, in this equation are which two terms? Yep, this one and this one. Those are the only two that are not a function. Well, I guess technically one is not either. Uh, these are the only two variables that are not a function of x1, but everything else is. So what we get when we evaluate this integral, and we will, I'll only set it up and then I'll go to the final result because it's, it's similar to what we've seen before. We have to use the product rule. Oh, so this should be gamma 2. Yes, gamma 2 here. Activity coefficient 2. Yeah, the left-hand side, the, sorry, the leftmost term, that's all. Uh, this is this term here, and this expression is that all over there. It's got one additional term because we have that uh, 1, 1 minus up there. We didn't have to do this. We could have done dx2, dx1 as well, but then we know we just have to manipulate that later on. Okay, so in this, uh, in this term right here, we have a couple of, I don't know, awkward looking variables. Basically, these expressions here, they'll eventually cancel out due to the gibbs duhem equation. And if we work through the calculus and simplify it and manipulate it and play around with it, 
we get to come up with a very nice expression that looks like this. This is our final result for the conditions that dictate if we have a minimum or a maximum in the bubble curve. To get to this point, it's fairly standard kind of thermodynamic manipulation. No changing around of, uh, of partial derivatives, though. So it's fairly straightforward. So let's look at the consequences of this. So if we look at our Routes Law expression here, and we solve this for the activity coefficient times by the saturation pressure, which is what we have in the equation above. Right, so if we said, instead set this to, let's say, component 1, then this will have to be equal to the exact mirror of that, right? Oops. So by combining the expression for the conditions of a minimum or a maximum with our vapor liquid equilibrium expression. We isolate this middle relationship here. The pressure is always constant in an equilibrium system, so those obviously cancel. And so what we have left is the conclusion that at dp dx one equal to zero, that y1 over x1 is equal to y2 over x2, or x1 equals y1 and x2 equals y2, meaning that there's no change in composition from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. Right, the mole fraction in the liquid is exactly equal to the mole fraction in the vapor for component one, and the mole fraction for component 2 in the liquid is exactly equal to the mole fraction in or component 2 in the vapor. So this is an azeotrope, which means that you cannot purify the system based on the relative volatility differences, meaning that you will run into a pinch point or a point that you can no longer actually separate the fluids. So if you look at this on an XY diagram, which is what we talked about last week for solving uh, distillation problems, so this is y, this is x, we have a 45 degree line, this is the y equals x line. We will find ourselves at a condition where our vapor liquid equilibrium crosses over the y is equal to x line. And so our XY diagram will look something like this. So if we were to feed a liquid, let's say at this point right here, and we wanted to count out equilibrium stages, we can never cross the pinch point. And if we can go down this way, fine enough. Right, we can purify it as arbitrarily as we want down to the left, but up this way here, we run into the azeotrope and a pitch point. Make sense? Okay, the other interesting property about the azeotrope is that if at the azeotrope 
your liquid composition is the same as your vapor composition, that simplifies your Routes law extensively. Right, these two terms cancel out, in which case we can use an azeotrope to solve for what our activity coefficient has to be at that point. So if we have a two-component mixture, That means we have two vapor liquid equilibrium expressions, right, like this one up here, that have to be solved simultaneously, which means we have two activity coefficient equations, which means that we can fit a two variable model. So in the case of this week's homework, you're using the van lar activity coefficient model. And the two components in that model are alpha and beta. There's the one constant Margulis, there's the two constant Margulis, there's the Wilson equation, there's the NRTL, there's regular solution theory, there's Uniquac, there's Unifac. We don't have time to cover all of them. But it doesn't really matter, because the book perfectly describes how to apply any single one of those models. So the key thing to remember is, how do you manipulate them? The activity coefficient is just some modeling fit, whether it be strictly empirical, in the case of the one or two constant Margulis equation, or strictly theoretical, in the case of regular solution theory, or some mixture in between. It's just a model, grab the equation, put it down, it's based on real data, or it's based on some theoretical foundation. But ultimately, right, what we're trying to do is figure out how to take this information and solve problems with it. So with an azeotrope, we can very easily, you know, tune an activity coefficient model as well. But there's other ways you can do it with curve fitting and things like that, but it's really convenient if you have an azeotrope. Not convenient for the separation, but obviously convenient for the actual mathematics. Okay, so let's talk about how we break azeotropes. Put breaking in quotation marks. We're not changing the fundamental phase equilibrium, but we're, practically speaking, overcoming it. So the problem with an azeotrope is that we cannot use vapor-liquid equilibrium to purify the mixture beyond a certain point at the pinch point or at the azeotrope. So the only way you can break an azeotrope is to shift the conditions at which it exists. Right? There's more elaborate methods where you take advantage of maybe adding in a third component that changes the vapor-liquid equilibrium a little bit and eliminates it. Uh, those are going to be more custom designed. They're not going to be as broadly generalizable. So what we'll talk about is sort of a general approach that can be used to break an azeotrope. So if we have a distillation column, I'll call this the feed. This will be the bottoms for column one. Column one is going to be operating, well, temperature is going to change. We'll call it at P1, but the temperature varies throughout. We have distillation column two. What we'll need to have in an azeotrope is a second column operating at P2. We'll have bottom stream two and top stream two. So if we draw this out on an XY diagram, we're going to have some sort of an XY curve that looks like this, has to cross over the Y is equal to X line. This is our azeotrope. We're going to say that this is our feed composition, 
we have a bottoms composition. So if we count out stages, let's say we have a, a couple of stages. One, two, three, four. So four stages gets us pretty close to that azeotrope. Now at this point down here, this will be our top one composition. And we'll say it's near the azeotrope. Right, just as you can't purify something to 100% purity, there will always be some trace impurities. In theory, you can never truly get to the azeotrope. For you know, practical purposes, you can get close enough that you, know, you may not be able to measure the impurities, but we'll say we're near the azeotrope, because technically speaking, getting to the azeotrope is just the same thing as saying you're 100% pure. So now our strategy that I kind of already gave away is that we are going to look at what is the change in pressure. Now the idea behind this is uh, looking at the properties of the pure species. Right? They may have very similar boiling points uh, as pure components. Right? And the azeotrope, if we go all the way back um, to where we started, as the pure boiling points get closer together, right, a smaller amount of sort of non-ideality might get you to that point where you have a maximum or a minimum. But if you have two components that have vastly different boiling points, you have to have a huge activity coefficient to get that thing to have a max or a minimum. Right? So in the case of where you have two components that are maybe similar in boiling point, like the uh, was it ethanol cyclohexane in the homework, Right, those two have very similar boiling points. So if you look at the ideal Routes law curve for the Homer problem on number five, they're super close together. But if you look at the non-ideal behavior, it's massively, massively different. Right? You have a huge maximum uh, pressure azeotrope in that particular mixture for the homework. Right? So in general, the azeotropes are going to be occurring more frequently when you have things that are similar volatility. So. But what we want to do is look at how can we change that. Well, just because they may have a similar volatility now, they're not necessarily going to have the same critical point, the same vapor pressure. Well, they are going to have the same vapor at that point, but the same heat of vaporization. So if we look at the clausius clapeyron equation, they may have a similar vapor pressure at the particular conditions of the distillation column. But the hope is that they may not have necessarily the same heat of vaporization. So by changing the pressure, you're going to change the temperature at which the pure species boils so that P star, right, so the vapor pressure of any particular component is not necessarily going to change exactly the same for component one versus component two. Right, by increasing the pressure maybe one of the two components is closer or further away from its critical point, so its relative change in the vapor pressure is going to be different. And so if you recall that if we look at a plot of the vapor pressure versus temperature, they're exponential curves. So which of these two species do we think is closer to its critical point? 
I would say that this one right here is probably closer to its critical point. It's an ex so vapor pressure is an exponential function. So as it, soon as it starts to sort of shoot up, it just keeps on going faster and faster and faster until it reaches its critical point. I wouldn't say it's a general rule, right? But that's the general curve of how a vapor pressure is going to go on. So we may be operating at a condition similar here, right? But small changes in the temperature or the pressure of the system, right? are going to result in larger and larger differences in the individual pure species properties. And that's the way that we take advantage of shifting the pressure in two distillation columns to try and break the azeotrope. Right, because in a two-phase system, pressure and temperature are linked together, especially for a pure component. For a pure component, right, I cannot independently change the saturation pressure and saturation temperature. So what we get out of this then is if we look at the XY diagram that we have there. If we call this one at P1, we can draw out another uh, XY diagram that may look slightly different. It shouldn't ever actually go down like that. Let's try that again. All right, so we'll notice by shifting the pressure we have moved the azeotrope ever so slightly. The larger the swing in pressure, the more you would expect the azeotrope to move. If you can't shift the pressure that much for some other constraints on materials or pressure or temperature of your process, right, you may have to then try and purify it to get it in between this sort of zone right here where you can manipulate where the azeotrope composition is. So what would happen then in the second case is that we would have the tops, right, that we have purified to near the azeotrope composition, right, now in column one it's to the left of the azeotrope, in column two it's to the right of the azeotrope, and then we can count off the stages to purify it to whatever composition we want to purify it to. So in the case of this zone over here, this is where things get a little bit weird, and the more volatile component is actually the one that tends to stay in the liquid more, and the less volatile component is the one that boils away more, right? But multi-component phase equilibrium is very complex and non-intuitive, right? So if we were to look at the PXY diagram, we have our maximum here. So in this case, this is where, you know, I mean, things get a little weird in vapor-liquid equilibrium. But the reason why the XY curve is sort of flipped down right there is because of, you know, unexpected behavior. So it's kind of weird that if we add more X1, right, or more liquid of, of component 1, that's the more volatile species. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that as you add more of the volatile species, you're actually lowering the pressure at which it boils, which is kind of weird to think about, right? You would think that as you add more of the volatile species, it'll want to boil more. But in this case, no. The non-ideality prevents that from happening. Okay, so azeotropes, uh, they are very useful for obtaining thermodynamic data. So if you know the azeotropic composition of a mixture, you can then tune a activity coefficient model. You can perfectly tune the activity coefficient model if you've got two variables that are unknowns. If you have more than that, you'll have to input some other additional data, maybe the activity coefficient at infinite dilution, for example. Right? And that's how you can really build fairly elaborate activity coefficient models with very limited data. So again, a lot of what we're doing here is teaching the system so that if you were to go in the lab, and people don't do this very much anymore, but if you were doing this in the you know, old school days of the 40s and 50s of chemical engineering, a lot of people would just be measuring these properties because we didn't know how to, how to really well design separations and things like that. But a lot of this classical vapor liquid equilibrium research was all done in sort of the 50s and 60s and 40s, measuring activity coefficients, trying to understand what are the correlations and what are the trends. So it's kind of an old field now, but a lot of this was I don't want to have to measure vapor liquid equilibrium at 20 points for 20 different mixtures. Right, what's the minimum number of things that I can do to get the data across? Okay, so this should give you everything you need to finish the homework.
Uh, that'll wrap up, uh, I think this is our last lecture on vapor liquid equilibrium, so then we'll move on to talking a bit more about liquid liquid equilibrium, in which case activity coefficients are critical, uh, and then uh, expect the homework uh, to be assigned soon. So have a good week.